Hi, this is Bill Osmond, City Manager in Douglasville. February is Black History Month, and on our On the Agenda program, we want to look at some moments and some people in history locally and in this nation uh, who have been important to our society. And we want to do this as part of the observance of Black History Month. So join me today for On the Agenda. This is Bill Osmond, City Manager in Douglasville. Welcome to On the Agenda. You know, in reality, the history of America is a history of all of us, all the people who have lived in America. And in the month of February, On the Agenda, we'll be taking a look at a number of people and events during the observance of Black History Month. We believe it's important for our viewers to gain a better uh, information, more information on local history and also uh, history in our country and do this with a focus on black history in February. On this edition of On the Agenda, I'll be talking with a man who was very instrumental in the civil rights movement in the South almost 50 years ago. His name is Lonnie King and he was the head of the student sit-in movement in Atlanta in 1960. And of course the student sit-in movement to integrate uh, restaurants uh, in Atlanta and elsewhere was one of the key components of what got nationwide attention to the civil rights movement. That and of course the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama led by Dr. Martin Luther King. Let me give you a little bit of personal history. You know all of us have a personal history. I grew up uh, in the segregated South. Uh, when I was in school, white students and African American students went to separate schools. Now my father was a school superintendent, so I know personally that the white schools received far more equipment, better books, better facilities than did the African American students. Now, if you were an African American and you wanted to go to a restaurant, you had to go to a restaurant in what was known as the black part of town. When you got on public transportation, you had to move to the back of the bus. Now, those are just a few examples, but probably serve to the generation who was alive at that time a reminder of conditions in the South. And for those of our viewing audience who are of the younger generations, it's probably something that you have a hard time identifying with since, of course, the restaurants have always been open to African American families and white families. Uh, but when I was growing up, for example, there were segregated restrooms and drinking fountains except in many places there were no restrooms or drinking fountains for African-American citizens. But we hope through this and the next edition of On the Agenda to give you information that will help you have a, a better understanding and uh, we're doing this as part of the observance of Black History Month. Now I graduated from the University of Georgia in 1960. Uh, went to work as a reporter for the Atlanta Journal. Uh, frankly that was an exciting time uh, to be a reporter in the South. Uh, now, the sit-in movement uh, had already uh, concluded in a sense by the time I graduated, but as a young reporter, I was able to cover the Freedom Rides, the desegregation of the Atlanta school system, went to a lot of rallies in both the African American community and Ku Klux Klan and other groups. So it was a period of, of, of uh, a lot of unrest in the South that resulted though in many changes which have brought us to where we are today uh, where we think nothing of the fact that uh, African-American families, white families, you see them in restaurants, theaters, uh, moving about in the community, uh, integrated housing and so forth. But uh, I didn't move to Douglasville until 1985, so I didn't live in Douglasville, Douglas County during the time of segregation. But uh, there were a number of people locally that uh, we will be sharing uh, stories with you on as they reflect on what has happened uh, in their lives down through the years. In a moment, I'll be back to talk with Mr. Lonnie King as we continue with this edition of On the Agenda. Welcome back to On the Agenda. My special guest at this time is Mr. Lonnie King. I first heard of 
Mr. King back in uh, the time that the sit-in movement started in the South. Uh, and though I had not met him until a few weeks ago, uh, obviously I had, had read a lot about him, had, had seen him on television, and delighted to have him with us today because uh, back at, at those times in the uh, 1960, uh, to the surprise of me personally, and I'm sure probably most people in the South, uh, African American citizens and white citizens alike, a group of college students in North Carolina uh, went to what at that time was all white restaurants to seek service. Uh, and uh, the, that movement spread rather quickly. And in Atlanta, uh, there began sit-in movements and the leader in that was a, a college student uh, by the name of uh, Lonnie King. And here we are approximately 50 years later uh, Mr. King, it's great to have you on the agenda. It's my pleasure to be here. I know that uh, at that time, if you look at what was going on in, in, in the turbulent South, uh, that from my personal opinion, who was a young newspaper reporter when part of this was happening, uh, that of course you had the, the bus boycott in Montgomery being led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, another uh, factor that began to play into nationwide attention uh, for the civil rights uh, legislation and, and the focus in the South were the student, college students, uh, who uh, uh, were brave young men and women who uh, went to, to previously, uh, at that time, uh, white restaurants seeking service. Now, they were denied service, uh, they were harassed, they were arrested. And I know for our viewers, uh, probably of the younger generations, African American and white viewers alike, you probably don't understand much about that because all of your lives you've been able to go to restaurants uh, and be able to receive service. But that's not the way it was uh, in the South in, in those days. Uh, uh, Mr. King, uh, tell me how you happened to get involved in, in uh, becoming a leader uh, uh, of the student sit-in movement in Atlanta. Well, I think it was something that flowed directly from my exposure in the U.S. Navy. Uh, prior to my going into the Navy, I had grown up in Atlanta, had only gone outside the South once to Washington, D.C., and I didn't know anything but segregation, to be very honest with you. But when I went into the Navy, I went into uh, an operation that was, uh, I guess you would say quasi-integrated, because there were still some pockets in the Navy that, uh, in 1954 uh, that were not what they should have been. But my Navy experience, um, uh, I guess you would say prepared me for launching uh, when I came back to Atlanta. Uh, I remember as I was leaving the Navy, I told a friend of mine, uh, Everett Render, who had been my manager. I was a prize fighter in the Navy, and so uh, I was supposed to go to USF on a boxing scholarship, but I turned it down to come back to Morehouse. And one of the points that I made to uh, Mr. Render was, I'm going back, although he said, I'm going to stay in California. He said, it's just bad in Atlanta. I said, I'm going back because one day I believe that we're going to be able to um, come together and get rid of the segregation down there, and I want to be a part of it. Right. So um, I, think we, I think it's a matter of, of um, uh, preparation, uh, meeting opportunity. And when the young men uh, in Greensboro uh, had the uh, audacity, the nerve, the fervor to go out and start this battle I, on the 2nd of February when I read about it I said to a couple of friends of mine uh, we ought to do that here. Uh, one of them was Joseph Pierce who had been uh, a, a dear friend all the way through high school who was at Morehouse with me and another one was Julian Bond and so we all agreed that we were going to do it mm -hmm. and we in fact uh, did organize and of course um, we learned uh, very quickly that the college presidents had their ears to the ground and so they heard about what we were doing, and they um, asked us to come to a meeting. And, of course, we came to the meeting, and they wanted to know, what are you about to do? And we, they gave us their long spiel about their responsibility for the safety and welfare of the students, so forth and so on, as they should have. Uh, and then when I looked around the room as they were bringing us together, I noticed a lot of different people that I had contacted <laughs> about getting in this movement. 
So when Dr. Clement, Rufus Clement, who was mm -hmm. the president of the Council of College Presidents, finished his, um, I guess you would say, his a pitch to us to, to go back to class, basically. Uh, and, but, but before you go back to class, explain what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, at that point, everybody looked at me uh, to explain what it is that we were trying to do. And so I stepped up to the plate and told them that I thought that um, we had been segregated long enough and that we needed to go forward and bring about a change. And um, we had this nice, terse debate between me and the college presidents, but I wouldn't yield. And they finally came up with the idea of us writing an appeal for human rights. Uh, they pointed out that we need to have, you need to have, if you're going to do this, a document that sets forth why you are doing it. He said, we are the AU Center. We are the cream of the crop. And we need to have written some reason for symbolic and historical reasons why we did what it is that what we did. And so we did write the Appeal for Human Rights, which was published in your paper on the 9th of March in 1960. And it was published in the New York Times later on. And Dr. Clement raised all the money to pay for that. Right. Um, so that's how we got started. And of course, on the 15th of March, the Ides of March, uh, we sat down simultaneously at 11 o'clock, no, 11.30, in about 13 different places mm -hmm. in Atlanta. Um, and the rest, I guess, is somewhat history, and we'll fiddle it in as we go forward. Right. I know during the time of the sit-in movement and, and other uh, civil rights activities in the South, uh, uh, you probably were very frequently identified as being a relative of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and I know that the two of you did work closely together. Tell us about your ties with Dr. King. Well, my mother brought me from behind the cotton curtain, uh, which was, I was, I was down in Arlington, Georgia, and I, and I call that the cotton curtain, uh, because everything down there was a plantation type, uh, to Atlanta when I was eight. And uh, she had joined Ebenezer Baptist Church, of which King's father was the pastor mm -hmm. and grandfather also. So I grew up down there, and of course I knew all the Kings because my mother kept me in church almost every day except Saturday. Uh, and uh, at the time she was doing it, I didn't like it, but I must admit that it had a lot to do with uh, who I am today. Uh, that Robin King's, Dr. King's daddy preached um, liberation theology. He preached that we've got to end the yoke of segregation. Almost every Sunday he, he was saying something like that. Um, and I think that when you, when you begin to write on that slate, of a young person, this kind of information, whereas they may be alternating between sleep and what have you, they do catch some of it. Mm -hmm. And I think I caught some of it. Uh, they gave me the chance to, to, to do a lot of things at Ebenezer that, I, that many young people may not have had a chance to do. I, I introduced, for instance, some of the major speakers of our time, Dr. Mays, Mordecai Johnson, you name it. I was a young kid, 9, 10, and 11, meeting all these famous people mm -hmm. and hearing their speeches. And little did I know that I, that I was being prepared for something later on. Right. Um, so, but, but I knew Martin very well, and uh, he was, as you know, a tremendous orator. And one thing I learned about him is that if you want to be good at something, you have to practice at it. And he used to practice his speaking uh, during the week. Uh, even before he became a great preacher, he was practicing, practicing, practicing in the church. So um, when the movement time came around, I had an infrastructure of people that I could call on that I knew from the time I was a child to help us in Atlanta. And Martin King and his daddy and many others were a part of that group. Right. Well, as I've mentioned to you uh, when you and I talked several weeks ago, I've always considered you to be one of the most important people in the early days of, of uh, the civil rights movement, especially in Atlanta with your leadership uh, with the student sit-in movement. And I know that you and the other students involved certainly made a great impression on uh, citizens uh, in Georgia, in the South, uh, African-American citizens, uh, white citizens alike. And we probably could sit here and talk for hours about uh, your experiences, but I know that uh, you're working on a book so that uh, at some point uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, get that book and be able to spend some hours uh, uh, reading uh, about a lot of things that took place during that uh, time. Tell us about uh, the book and why you decided to uh, start writing it. Well, I did not get involved in the movement for posterity reasons. Um, I got involved because I thought it was right uh, that you should not be treating people 
based on the, their class or their color differently. Uh, and I also knew from my history classes that democracy was a, was a um, work in progress. You had to work at it, because uh, it's like mercury. It's very um, unstable if you don't work at it. Uh, I decided to write the book because um, there's been too much revisionism, revisionism uh, in the history of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, I've read about heroes that, that, were, that are now heroes that didn't even exist in 1960. Uh, they weren't even here. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I have a preliminary working title, which is kind of funny, but uh, the, the title has been suggested to me by Dr. Gwendolyn Middlebrooks. And she said, you ought to name it. Here's what really happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because there are a lot of people who have made a cottage industry out of, out of um, being a civil rights person. And I think that um, this is a free country. They have a right to do that. But there are just too many lies that have been told. And uh, I, I want to write the book because they're not about myself. I've been in a number of history books, so it's not a matter of me trying to get a place in history. But I do think that people who uh, rode the bus every day to bring sandwiches to us because we didn't have any money to buy food, that we ought to acknowledge that those persons were here on this, right. uh, on, on this earth. There were people who put up their houses to bail us out of jail, whose names are never in the history books. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to know about those people. Uh, there were maids who uh, helped us tremendously. Um, so I want to be sure that there, there's at least one book <laughs> written about this era where we list the hundreds and thousands of names of people, faceless, many of them. Right. Uh, I, want them I don't want to be nameless anymore, but at least the faces might not be known because I don't have the pictures. It's just a matter of trying to make the history a little bit more inclusive right. of what really happened. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a tendency uh, in history to write about the big man or about the big woman or about the big people. But it's really the little people who make the mm -hmm. difference. For instance, when we asked for a boycott on Richard's department store uh, in 1960, over 350 some people in this town sent me their credit card. But the point I'm making is that, and as I looked at those people whose cards came in, they weren't mm -hmm. the teachers, they weren't the doctors, they weren't the lawyers, they were the little people. Right who bought into what we were doing. Right. And so I'm going to write this book for the little people, it seems to me, yeah. uh, and to make sure that we include some of them in it. Um, even though I'm 71 years old now, I'm still an idealist. Uh, I think I have the heart of a 25-year-old and the energy of a 19-year-old. And I hope my brain is still at least as good as it was <laughs> when I was 30. Well, I read uh, in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, a few months ago now, uh, an article about you. In fact, uh, uh, they had a, a picture of you and Dr. King uh, walking down the, a sidewalk uh, to accompany that uh, article. But uh, uh, in the article, uh, when you were talking about some of, of the people who were behind the scenes and unknown, but you were highlighting uh, some people who were very influential or important that uh, maybe not a lot of people knew. and. One of the, the persons that you mentioned uh, was John Calhoun. Now, John Calhoun uh, was involved for many years in Atlanta, especially working on voter registration of African Americans, which, uh, again, for many of our uh, viewers uh, don't realize how difficult it was for African Americans to vote uh, not all that many uh, decades ago. But John Calhoun, I've always considered one of the old patriarchs of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, it was my pleasure uh, to work with Mr. Calhoun and, and to know him. In fact, uh, uh, when he was in his late 70s and I was in my late 20s, uh, we worked together as a team with, on a consultant firm and, and uh, made several trips to South Georgia. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the time that we spent in a car between Atlanta and South Georgia, I heard a lot of stories and heard a lot of history. Uh, tell us about Mr. Calhoun and a couple of other uh, these type of individuals that you're talking about to be in your book. Okay, let me just point out that um, in the summer of 1960, uh, I recommended to our executive board that we send a telegram to each one of the presidential candidates, John Kennedy and uh, Richard Nixon. If you, if, you were, if you were living in Atlanta at that time, or in the world for, for that matter, and there was a presidential campaign going on, the issue of civil rights never came up. And, and we were having all these sit-ins all over the South, but the, president, the presidential candidates wanted to avoid it. Mm -hmm. So we, we were able to get Kennedy to, at least through his brother, make it appear as though he was involved. 
And that's when we took King to jail with us, mm -hmm. which swung the presidential election. Well, the African American community supported John Kennedy in every urban city, in every city in America, except in Atlanta. And the reason why Atlanta went for Nixon in the African American community was because of John Calhoun. John Calhoun is, is one of the most brilliant organizers that has ever come on this earth. And he had this thing down to a science where he could deliver the vote. Right. Uh, he was just a genius at it, and I'm, and, and I'm glad that I met him and I sat at his feet. Um, I want to also say that John Calhoun was a person who went to jail, but rather than give up the NACP role, membership roles in the 50s. Uh, he was a fearless kind of person. And it was really John Calhoun who convinced me to agree to the settlement on March the 7th, 1961, when I had been brought to this meeting where, where all the black leaders and the white leaders had come together mm -hmm. to, quote, settle the boycott that they weren't running. When I refused to sign, um, Ivan Allen and uh, A.T. Walden, who was the prominent lawyer at the time, called a recess in the meeting. And so they took me out into the cloakroom to talk to me, talk to this boy. And so I was beaten on by a lot of people. But then John Calhoun said something to me that I remember to this day. He said to me, Lonnie, I'm over 60 years of age. And every day of my life, I have been segregated. And if we can get the power structure to agree to desegregate a few months down the road, then I don't see that as a long period of time compared to my 60 some years. He said, I know you're ambitious and I know you, I know you want it done yesterday. He said, but why don't you go along with this? And it, and it was because of John Calhoun that I finally said, okay, I will go along with it subject to my going back to the students and having them uh, sanction it. Right. And of course, uh, but it was Calhoun and my, my immense respect for him that, that caused me to mean to, mean to go along with that. I certainly share that respect uh, for Mr. Callan, who was a great individual. Um, we've been looking back, uh, of course, uh, almost 50 years ago. Uh, a lot, of course, has happened since then. Uh, tell us uh, uh, what you've been doing over the, the intervening years and up to the point that now, as you say, in your early 70s, you're uh, writing this book. Well, I've done a lot of things. I've, I, had an, 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 I owned the international consulting firm uh, and ran it for 10 years. Uh, we did very well. Um, I became a federal bureaucrat, uh, held a number of si significant nationwide positions uh, for the federal government, Department of Interior, Bureau of Land Management. Uh, and then I went into higher education as an assistant to the president of a college in, in Maryland. Uh, and then I started working on my doctorate and didn't finish, and so I'm going to finish it now in history. Um, I have. Um, done a number of things for my college as Alumni Association, national president. Um, I've been busy. Um, let me see. In 19, in the, I was the first African American elected as president of the Young Democrats in Washington, D.C., and I led the, the Home Rule movement there, the Broadbot Home Rule. Mm -hmm. uh, I got Senator Wayne Morse of uh, Oregon to agree to lead the effort, and he said to me that if you will get 10,000 people at the Washington Monument, uh, I will personally, since he was the head of the district committee, I will personally go to Lyndon Johnson and get home rule for D.C. Uh, I got Dick Gregory, Harry Belafonte, and many others, and we had 20,000 people there. So Wayne Moore spoke at that meeting, and he said, I promised this young man I'd do it, and I'm going to do it. That's how D.C. got home rule. Right. So right. those are the kinds of things I've been doing. What am I doing now currently? Well, I'm, I've organized a group called CUBE, Citizens United for Better Education. And the reason why I did this is because We've got to do something about this pipeline to prison. We've got to do something about these young African-American boys who uh, have on their slate that I talked about earlier the wrong kinds of things. And I'm hoping that we can use technology in some way to reach these young men, and also young women too, but certainly young men, before they get to the third grade and see can't we begin to steer them in a more positive uh, uh, direction. Oftentimes society thinks, well, we're spending money on, on education, and we're spending a lot of money on, on, on education. You're actually spending more money on incarceration. Mm -hmm. But that comes through the back door. 
And so what we've got to do is get the public to understand that we've got to turn around here and do something about this. Bill, America is in a battle for its life in terms of global dominance. I'm an American, and I believe that I'm just as rah, rah, rah as, as anybody else. But we are not going to be able to continue the kind of lifestyles that we've had in the past if we continue trying to take ourselves in a position where we only let 75% of our population get a quality education. We're going up against the Asian powers, China, India, you, you name it. And they are doing a better job of making sure that the educational enrichments that are available in their society reach at a much broader level. Mm -hmm. And we have, we have to do, do something about that. And I see a lot of these young kids as like diamonds in the rough. And I'm hoping that we can polish some of these diamonds so that they can become more productive um, members of, uh, of our society. As I said earlier, the democracy is a work in place, is a, is a, is a work in project, uh, in our process. And uh, we, we have to work at it. And we still have too many people left behind. Right. Uh, I won't get it done in my lifetime, but I'm hoping that I can light a candle on a few people to keep it going. Right. Well, you've certainly lit some candles in your lifetime that uh, resulted in, in a lot of illumination in a lot of places. And uh, as I said to our viewers, uh, uh, while I had not met you until a, a few months ago, certainly I uh, knew about you and, and the things that you were involved in and, and the historic changes that were made because of, of uh, the uh, initiatives that you and, and some other brave college students uh, took back uh, in the early 1960s. Uh, any closing comments you would like to make here on City TV? <laughs> well, the only thing I think I'd like to say in conclusion is thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to Douglas County uh, residents. Um, I'm just hoping that um, black and white citizens would begin to stop, breathe, take a, take a, take a time out, and realize that we're all Americans. Uh, we're, we're Americans 12 months a year. And it's good for us to note something that happened in the African-American community once a year, but we need to be concerned about the least of us 12 months a year. And, uh, and, I, th and I think until we begin to take a look at that, uh, we're going to always be kind of behind. We are, in fact, our brother's keeper, whether we like it or not. Well, again, thank you, Mr. King, for being Thanks. with us today. Uh, yeah. It's great to have you, and it's great to have our viewers today on City TV. Uh, this is Bill Osborne, City Manager, and we both hope that you have a great day. Thank you for joining me today for On the Agenda. I hope you've enjoyed this program as part of the observance of Black History Month. City TV will have another episode of On the Agenda coming up uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, and we'll do another feature on Black History Month. Have a great day.